Welcome to the National Arts Club NAC at Home program. I'm Angela Louie, and thank you so much for joining us. For those who are unfamiliar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts and to educate the American people in the fine arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Today, we talk about the art of wedding fashion across time and cultures. And with me to talk about this is the lovely Dr. Kimberly Chrisman Campbell. Here's a little about Kimberly. Kimberly Chrisman Campbell is a fashion historian, curator, and journalist, and the recipient of a 2020 NEH Public Scholar Award. She holds degrees from Stanford University, the Courtauld Institute of Art, and the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. She is the author of Fashion Victims, Dress at the Court of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, Worn on This Day, The Clothes That Made History, and The Way We Wed, A Global History of Wedding Fashion. She writes about fashion, art, and culture for the Washington Post, The Atlantic, Politico, and The Wall Street Journal. A former curatorial fellow at the Huntington Library and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, she has lectured at museums around the world, including the National Gallery and the Met, and has appeared as a fashion commentator on the Biography Channel, NPR, and Reels. Dr. Kimberly's latest book, The Way We Wed, A Global History of Wedding Fashion, is available for purchase in the link in the chat box. The book showcases the wedding fashion from the Renaissance to the present day. Following this presentation, we will have a brief Q&A where Dr. Kimberly will answer some questions from the audience. So please type your questions into the chat box at any time during the presentation, and we will do our very best to get to them. Welcome, Dr. Kimberly. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back, Angela. It's such an honor to see you again. Um, so, you know, I want to start off with this question, which is, um, what, uh, what is a fashion historian and, and how did you become um, this, uh, this expert and this amazing fashion historian? Fashion history is something I've been interested in since I was a little girl. It wasn't until I got to college that I figured out you could actually do it as a job, as a curator, as a teacher, uh, as an archivist or researcher. Uh, I approached it through art history, my, my degrees in art history, which is a great way to learn about the history of fashion. Uh, but there are many paths. Some people come at it from museum studies or anthropology or textile history. Uh, there's no right or wrong way. And it's a lot of fun. That's so fascinating. You know, um, you, we were just chatting a few minutes ago and you said that you are receiving a lot of questions about fashion, about wedding fashion, particularly in this crucial time, this transitional time um, for of people being from virtual to hybrid. Why do you think wedding fashion is so fascinating for the public and also for museums? Well, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, one reason, of course, is that a lot of it survives. People always save their wedding gowns or even maybe something they wore to somebody else's wedding. Uh, so there's a lot of it around in museums. And it, there's a lot, I think, that we don't understand about it, even though it, it does seem so familiar and so ubiquitous. So we'll, we'll get into some of those questions tonight. Wonderful. And, um, you know, final question, which is a preview, I think, of what, you, what you're going to show us. But um, what uh, is your favorite chapter in the book so that we can be prepared for it when you're showing us the images from it? Uh, my favorite chapter is the one on wartime weddings, which mm -hmm. have a lot of similarities with COVID weddings, as we're going to see. Wonderful. Okay, so um, a reminder for the audience that a link to Kimberly's book of the images from, from these, this extraordinary uh, slideshow um, is going to be available for purchase in the link. And if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we'll do our very best to uh, get to them at the end of the presentation. 
Um, Kimberly, we are all ready to see these gorgeous wedding fashion photos from your book. Can you share them with us now? I'd love to. Well, welcome everyone. Good evening or good afternoon if you're on the West Coast, as I am. Wherever you are, thank you for being here. If you were here on Zoom when I talked about my last book, Worn on This Day, you might remember me saying that museums are full of wedding gowns and other elaborate ceremonial garments that have been preserved for their sentimental value as well as for their monetary value and aesthetic value. But I questioned whether they reflected the fashions of their times or the everyday dress of their wearers. What I learned in the course of writing that book is that the answer was often yes. In fact, many of the so-called traditions governing wedding fashion are actually relatively recent innovations, while many of the wedding practices that we think of as being very modern or very trendy actually have ancient roots. In the end, I found so many significant and surprising wedding clothes while I was researching more on this day that I decided to write a whole new book about them. And that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Obviously, there have been many books on wedding fashion, many good books on wedding fashion, but I saw an opportunity to tell some new stories and depart from the all too common narrative of white people in white dresses. I want to take a broader temporal and geographic perspective and look beyond the bride and her big day to grooms, attendants, guests, and events like betrothal ceremonies and bachelorette parties. We tend to think that we invented the wedding week, but I'm showing you two different, very beautiful outfits worn by royal women for important pre-wedding ceremonies and events that have been taking place for hundreds of years. On the left is Japan's Princess Sayako wearing a colorful 12-layer kimono for her ceremonial visit to the Imperial Palace shrines before her wedding in 2005. And on the right, Empress Elizabeth of Austria's gown for her Polter Abend, a raucous wedding eve party held in 1854. Also, as in Lord on this day, I discussed paintings, photos, fashion magazines, diaries, memoirs, and news reports, in addition to surviving garments. Because the things that find their way into museums often don't tell the whole story. Fashion and art museums tend to collect garments because they have aesthetic value or designer labels, and that usually means clothes worn by the wealthy and well-connected. I also con consulted different kinds of museum collections, like local historical societies, war museums, and presidential libraries, which have much different collecting priorities. Having said that, there are a lot of famous faces in the book. And that's because royals, socialites, and celebrities have always been important wedding influencers, not just setting fashion trends like the pink wedding gown or the black bridesmaid dress, but popularizing and really normalizing things like beach weddings, double weddings, and destination weddings, as well as more controversial practices like same-sex weddings, interracial or cross-cultural marriages, and remarriage after divorce, which found widespread acceptance only after celebrities did them first. I think one of the reasons wedding clothes survive and continue to fascinate us today, as Angela asked me, is because they do so much work to mitigate the drama inherent in legally binding together two people, two families, two countries, or two cultures. Although, as we will see, there is still plenty of room for drama. It's also important to remember that many of the wedding gowns that do survive, whether in museum collections or dusty attics, haven't been identified as such simply because they're not white. The idea of wearing a white wedding gown and wearing it only once is an extremely modern one. Queen Victoria wasn't the first bride to wear white, but she was instrumental in popularizing it when she married Prince Albert in 1840. Previously, royal brides had worn gold or silver, but Victoria was determined to go to the altar as an ordinary woman rather than a monarch, even if she did wear an 18-foot court train over her fashionable dress. The fact that white symbolized innocence, purity, and virginity, and visually set the bride apart from the other guests ensured its lasting appeal. But white has always been more popular among upper-class brides, and it's gone out of fashion in times of war, mourning, or economic hardship. 
Furthermore, for a long time, it was considered more appropriate for young first-time brides. Older brides and widows typically wore gray, lavender, and other colors. While women who could not afford an impractical white gown wore their best dress, regardless of its hue. Even a white wedding gown would become part of a bride's wardrobe. Early bridal magazines were full of suggestions on how brides could adapt their wedding gowns for everyday use by cutting off the train and making it into a jacket, for example, or dyeing a white gown to make it a more serviceable color. Throughout history, fashion has reinforced the notion that every bride is queen for a day, as garments historically reserved for the court, like trains and tiaras, have crept into civilian wedding clothes. That's why Swedish brides wear crowns, and Chinese brides wear imperial dragon tunics. Royal families may play a largely symbolic role in modern life, but they still wield enormous power as arbiters of style and guardians of tradition. When human rights activist Mabel Viss Smith married the Dutch Prince Friso in 2004, she enlisted avant-garde Dutch design duo Victor and Rolf to make an unconventional wedding gown that winked at tradition without offending it. The white satin dress had long sleeves, a modest bateau neckline, a floor length skirt and a 10 foot train, but it was covered in a fabric trellis adorned with 128 bows that grew in size towards the hemline where they reached comically gigantic proportions. Though the gown looked fairly conservative from the front, the surreal back view was an ironic comment on the pomp and circumstance of the event. While some commentators found this tongue-in-cheek dress disrespectful, others hailed it as a masterpiece of modern Dutch design. And when Victor and Rolf created a capsule collection for H&M in 2006, they included a $349 gown trimmed with a giant bow reminiscent of Princess Mabel's, giving fresh currency to the idea of being queen for a day. In America, in the absence of a monarchy, the lifestyles of the merely rich and famous have long offered harmless escapism in addition to fashion inspiration. Well before Instagram, high society weddings were reported in forensic detail in newspapers and illustrated magazines. One of the first non-royal weddings to attract global media coverage was the union of American heirs Consuelo Vanderbilt and the Duke of Marlborough in New York in 1895 on the left. When the media couldn't get details of Vanderbilt's wedding dress and trousseau, they simply made them up. Vanderbilt's wedding wasn't eclipsed until 1920, when Detroit automobile heiress Delphine Dodge got married in what the media dubbed a million dollar wedding on the right. The bride wore a Lucille Couture gown described as white satin with a short, meaning calf length skirt and insets of Belgian lace outlined with silver thread. But it's almost impossible to see the gown under her cloud-like tulle veil and overstuffed bouquet. London-based Lucille was the international go-to for stylish wedding gowns, bridesmaid dresses, and trousseaus in the teens and 20s. In contrast to the boy of silhouette of the 1920s, these sleek, sinuous, bias-cut gowns of the 1930s emphasize the female form. Vogue said that the bride appears at her loveliest in the new fitted and molded gowns with long, sweeping lines. When Delphine Dodge's cousin Frances got married in the drawing room of her family's Michigan mansion in 1938, she didn't just wear something blue, everything was blue. The bride paired her ice blue satin gown with a matching veil of blue illusion netting. The Detroit Free Press reported that the bridal party was a rhapsody in blue, dressed in every color and cadence of moonlight blue for an ombre effect a popular choice for bridesmaids in the late 20s and 30s. All the dresses were made by New York designer Peggy Hoyt and reflect the influence of Hollywood glamour on wedding fashion, as well as the late hour of the evening ceremony, which was followed by dancing under the stars. Dodge's dress may have also been inspired by one of the most famous brides of the day, Wallace Simpson 
who had married the former King Edward VIII the previous year. He famously abdicated the British throne to marry the American divorcee, who wore a gown and jacket of bias-cut silk crepe in cornflower blue. The designer, Mainbacher, chose it to match her eyes and called it Wallace Blue. The gown survives in the Met, but the dye has faded over time. It was widely copied and worn by both brides and non-brides on both sides of the Atlantic. Pastel wedding gowns had a fashion moment in the 1930s. Heavenly blue or bridal blue evoked flattering associations with the Virgin Mary. But they were also especially appropriate for divorced brides. I included a chapter on dressing for remarriage in my book, because around the late 1800s, when the white wedding gown became a firmly entrenched social norm, a sharp divergence emerged between the clothes worn for first marriages and those worn for second or third or even fourth marriages. And that lasted for about 100 years. Etiquette books and fashion magazines hastily improvised alternatives to traditional symbols of youth and virginity, suggesting a hat or flowers instead of a veil, a corsage or prayer book instead of a bouquet, and a colored day dress or suit instead of a long white gown and train. In the era of conscious uncoupling, it may be difficult to appreciate just how stigmatized divorce and remarriage once were. They became increasingly acceptable in the 1930s, thanks to the mediating influence of Hollywood films, which frequently played divorce for laughs. The Gay Divorcee, a musical about a woman who hires a fake lover to secure a divorce from her boring husband, was released in 1934. So was the screwball comedy It Happened One Night, in which a spoiled heiress elopes with one man, immediately falls in love with another man, obtains an annulment, and remarries. In 1940, Cary Grant remarried his ex-wife in both The Philadelphia Story and His Girl Friday, a plot line that conveniently normalized divorce and reinforced traditional marriage. On screen, divorce was glamorous, hilarious, and usually temporary because a Hollywood ending depended on the divorced characters either remarrying or reconciling. The much publicized off-screen divorces and remarriages of stars like Mary Pickford and Phyllis Fairbanks, Ava Gardner and Mickey Rooney, and Lana Turner and Artie Shaw lent second-time brides social acceptance as well as providing them with fashion role models. On the left is the wedding scene from the Philadelphia story. Of course, the film is in black and white, but the wedding gown is closely based on the one Catherine Hepburn had worn in the stage version, which was in fact pink. And you can see that she wears it with a hat and a muff rather than a veil and bouquet. If remarriage was a fashion minefield, it was also a fashion opportunity. Divorced women had the freedom to wear stylish, sophisticated, and often highly sensual wedding dresses that they could expect to wear again. Postum serial Harris, Marjorie Merriweather Post, married and divorced four times between 1905 and 1964. In fact, she and her three daughters had 16 weddings between them. With all the attendant mother of the bride, bridesmaid, and flower girl dresses, their wardrobes encompassed an entire century's worth of elite wedding style, much of it still preserved at Hillwood, post Washington, D.C. estate. My favorite is the glamorous long sleeved gown of fur trimmed peach velvet that Post wore for her third wedding in December 1935. Though the neckline of the Bergdorf Goodman gown is rather modest, the skirt with its seven foot fan train clung to the 47 year old bride's statuesque figure. She wore no veil but carried an enormous bouquet of orchids, and her two youngest daughters served as her attendants wearing shimmering empire style gowns of ice blue satin created by Veronica, a theatrical costume house. By the 1940s, wedding gowns were as likely to reflect the fashions of the past as the present. Again, a trend spurred by Hollywood historical sagas like 1938's Marie Antoinette, 1939's Gone with the Wind and 1940's Pride and Prejudice. Gloria Vanderbilt, a distant cousin to Consuelo Vanderbilt and mother to Anderson Cooper, 
turned to former Paramount Studios costume designer Howard Greer for her wedding gown when she married her first husband, a movie producer, in 1941. For the lavish ceremony at the Santa Barbara Mission, Greer dressed the 17-year-old bride in a satin gown with a sweetheart neckline, short puffed sleeves, a draped bustled overskirt described as being in the style of 1890, and an elaborate headdress, opera gloves, and an appropriately cinematic 30-foot train. The bride on the couple's cake topper wore a miniature replica of Vanderbilt's gown and veil. The wedding was the social event of the season, but the marriage ended in divorce four years later. Vanderbilt subsequently had a second quickie wedding to conductor Leopold Strakowski in Mexico before marrying director Sidney Lumet in 1956. This time, she chose a look that was very different, but equally memorable. A romantic off-the-shoulder gown made from upcycled antique French linen from the 1830s. The beige hue was considered more appropriate than white for a divorcee, and the scoop-necked, ankle-length style was less formal than a traditional gown. The venue, a friend's New York apartment, was a suitably secular alternative to a church or synagogue. And the groom, who was also divorced, wore a suit and tie rather than formal wear, accessorizing with a cocktail. Instead of a veil, Vanderbilt wore a wreath of orchids, which matched her bouquet. If you didn't know this was 1950s, you might mistake it for late 60s or early 70s. Vanderbilt was years ahead of her time with this vintage boho chic look. In the 60s and 70s, as the iconoclastic post-war generation began to grow up and get married, and the widespread adoption of no-fault divorce laws caused the American divorce rate to double, the long-standing etiquette of remarriage evolved accordingly. White, for example, was now on the table for divorcees and widows, as long as it was short and worn without a veil. When Jacqueline Bouvier married Senator John F. Kennedy in 1953, she had wanted a quiet private ceremony and a contemporary French couture gown in the minimalist style that suited her best. But her new father-in-law had other ideas. Seeing the wedding as a public relations opportunity for his politically ambitious clan, he invited 1,200 guests and insisted that Bouvier wear a traditional gown fit for American royalty. It was designed by Anne Lowe, a prominent Black designer who dressed a wealthy WAF's clientele. While the taffeta gown was a work of art, it didn't fit Jackie's taste or figure. She compared it to a lampshade and complained that the portrait neckline emphasized her flat chest. It wasn't until her second wedding to Aristotle Onassis in 1968 that she got the contemporary couture dress she'd wanted all along, a knee-length Valentino from his so-called white collection. The era of the subdued second wedding is already history. Today, white wedding gowns no longer signify virginity, and divorce is no longer a social taboo that must be mitigated by scrupulous fashion etiquette. Repeat marriage ceremonies are often even more elaborate than first weddings, involving bigger budgets and blended families. And just like Katherine Hepburn in the Philadelphia story, brides who skipped a white wedding the first time around may seize the opportunity for a more traditional do-over, as Angelina Jolie did. Her first wedding to Johnny Lee Miller was a small civil ceremony. She wore black rubber pants and a white shirt with the groom's name written on it in her own blood. He wore black leather. For her second wedding to Billy Bob Thornton in Las Vegas, she wore jeans. Though her third wedding was almost as intimate, the setting was much grander, and so was her outfit. In 2014, Joey married Brad Pitt at the couple's French Chateau, wearing a full-skirted white satin gown by Atelier Versace. Her four-length tulle veil was embroidered with drawings created by the couple's six children, lending a witty personal touch to an otherwise classically elegant gown. Joey and Pitt had been together nine years, and like Marjorie Merriweather Post and many other couples with children, they wanted to include them in the ceremony, 
even to the point of letting them design the dress. Of course, marriage is for richer and for poorer, so I wanted to cover clothes worn by ordinary couples, as well as A-list celebrities like Brangelina. The advent of washable synthetic fabrics like rayon and nylon in the 1930s made it possible for brides to emulate the glamorous bias-cut silk and satin gowns of the silver screen without a Hollywood budget. Londoner Elizabeth Ray got married in 1938 in the last days of the depression. Like many brides of modest means, she made her own gown from inexpensive artificial silk, probably using a commercial pattern. But Ray had a cousin who was a seamstress for Norman Hartnell, the Queen's couturier, and she added couture quality beadwork around the collar and cuffs. Seamstresses are one group of working class women who have historically worn uniquely stylish wedding gowns. With access to high quality materials, fashion magazines, and well-to-do clients, they were abreast of the latest trends and had the skills to reproduce them, as well as a professional interest in dressing fashionably. In a trade that depended on the labor of young single women, weddings were inevitable. The Tarachi dressmaking shop in Providence, Rhode Island, had a policy of giving each of its seamstresses a custom-made gown as a wedding gift. The owners provided the materials, and the seamstresses worked together to sew a gown worthy of a paying customer, like the one seamstress Mary Riccatelli wore for her wedding in 1931, which is on the left. Kentucky dressmaker Ellen Curtis wore the gown in the center for her 1879 wedding. Instead of white, she used brown ribbed thigh and satin, with a view to wearing it again, probably when she called on potential clients. It was an impressive advertisement of her skills. Another field in which a stylish appearance and dressmaking skills were expected was service. Harriet Joyce, a lady's maid, made the purple gown at Wright for her wedding in Middlesex in 1899. Though colored dresses were certainly more practical, especially for a working class woman, Harriet was motivated by a different concern. At 35, she considered herself too old to wear white. The gown was expertly altered as fashions changed, indicating that she wore it over a long period of time and wanted to appear up to date. Another budget option was the paper wedding dress. Disposable paper dresses enjoyed a brief vogue in the turbulent late 1960s, when young people literally wore their politics on their sleeves and discarded them as easily as used Kleenex. In that volatile social and fashion climate, it's perhaps not surprising that wedding gowns and bridesmaid dresses also got the temporary treatment. If marriage was just a piece of paper, then the bride's gown could be one too. Why not, the Australian Women's Weekly asked in 1967. You only wear it once anyway. Paper dresses, actually made of flame-retardant, non-woven, synthetic, or cellulose, were perfect for young brides and bridesmaids with more dash than cash. They could be easily altered and worn again or simply tossed after the ceremony. At a 1969 wedding in Wisconsin, the bride cut two feet off the bottom of her Grecian-style gown after the ceremony to transform it into a mini-skirted cocktail dress for the reception. Although paper gowns were not made to last, a couple have survived, including the one on the right in the Texas Fashion Collection. This multi-person bridesmaid gown of scalloped yellow paper appeared in a disposable fashion show in New York in 1969. It had openings for four heads and eight arms, accessorized with paper headbands, gloves, and a paper bouquet. By this time, though, paper gowns were losing popularity to another budget bridal alternative, also launched in 1966, the romantic ruffled ready-to-wear dresses of British designer Laura Ashley, such as the one on the right, worn by Londoner Carolyn Peacock for her 1973 ceremony. During World War II, civilian clothing supplies were scarce, 
and weddings were usually small, last-minute affairs scheduled around unpredictable deployments and leaves. In Europe, rare white wedding gowns were passed around between friends. Elizabeth Ray loaned her artificial silk gown to four other brides during the war. In America, white weddings were actually encouraged to boost morale. And wedding gowns were exempt from wartime austerity regulations. Nevertheless, many American women chose to be married in day dresses, suits, or military uniforms, whether out of thrift or patriotism. The parachute gown was another patriotic option that didn't sacrifice style. Many parachute gowns have survived, but this one is rather special because the groom wore it too. It saved his life after the B-29 bomber he was piloting caught fire over Japan in 1944. He saved it and offered it to his fiancée for her wedding gown, and it's now in the Smithsonian. Family separation and displacement are grim features of civilian life during wartime. Yet weddings bring joy even in these sad circumstances. Chiyomi Maramoto and James Ogawa on the left got married in 1944 at Manzanar, an internment camp for Japanese Americans in the California desert. Chiyomi wore a gown made by her aunt, a professional seamstress, who was also interned there, using fabric they'd ordered by mail from Montgomery Ward. On the right, Lily Lacks and Ludwig Friedman were concentration camp survivors who met in the Bergen-Belsen Displaced Persons Camp in 1945. Lily dreamed of getting married in a white dress, so Ludwig bartered coffee and cigarettes for a white silk parachute from a former Luftwaffe pilot which a fellow survivor made into a gown for Lily and a matching shirt for Ludwig. Lily's sister, her cousin, and at least 15 other Jewish brides in the camp wore the gown for their own weddings. Both of these gowns were carefully saved and survived today. Cultural fusion, the practice of combining different cultures, religious traditions, and fashion influences in a single ceremony or celebration is a hot bridal trend today. Again, though, this is nothing new. Royal couples have been doing it for centuries, and more recently, it has played a part in proxy marriages during the age of immigration, as well as wartime weddings, when servicemen and women stationed overseas married foreigners. The sensitive deployment of specific culturally meaningful garments, designers, materials, or colors can diffuse controversy over cross-cultural weddings, signaling acceptance of each other's backgrounds and traditions. A good example of this is the wedding of Pakistani cricket legend Imran Khan and half-Jewish, half-Catholic socialite Jemima Goldsmith in London in 1995, which created an international media frenzy. Though the bride had converted to Islam, Security was high amid fears that Islamic militants would try to disrupt the civil ceremony. Meanwhile, British tabloids speculated that Goldsmith would have to adopt a conservative Muslim wardrobe and lifestyle, and perhaps even a new name. The paparazzi were waiting when the couple arrived at the registry office. The bride wore a long beaded white skirt suit by Bruce Oldfield, designer to her friend, Princess Diana, and a broad brimmed hat. It was reminiscent of Bianca Jagger's iconic wedding look on the right, while conforming to Muslim modesty standards, unlike Bianca, Jemima wore a shirt. The groom wore a traditional Pakistani kurta and vest. Without saying a word, the couple reassured both European and Middle Eastern audiences of their mutual respect as well as their intact individual identities. Contemporary fashion designers from bicultural backgrounds have been instrumental in promoting cultural fusion wedding attire. Designer Paula Chan Chuk is a half Samoan, half Chinese designer who lives in New Zealand. She makes traditional Western style wedding and pageant gowns, but she also uses traditional Polynesian materials like bark cloth, shells, and coconut fiber to create wedding gowns like these that marry diverse fashion and cultural traditions. Dutch artist Claudie Jongstra created the gown on the left for a Japanese-American bride. 
Its cascading design of a flame red phoenix on a sweeping train combines the iconography of a traditional bridal kimono and obi with a body conscious strapless silhouette in the, West, in the Western style. Chinese fashion designer Anna Ling Zhaojing designed a similar gown for her own wedding to an Irish aristocrat on the right. Again, the silhouette is unmistakably Western, but because white is the color of mourning in China, brides wear red, representing good luck, happiness, and prosperity. Increasingly, grooms are sharing in the creativity of cross-cultural weddings, rather than sticking to the tried and true international uniform of a suit or tuxedo. Walking Dead actor Stephen Yun and his bride Joanna Pack honored their shared Korean-American heritage at their 2016 wedding in Los Angeles, wearing modern versions of the traditional hanbok. The guests dined on fusion cuisine while a Motown band paid tribute to another cultural uh, influence in Yun's background, his hometown of Detroit. When Priyanka Chopra and Nick Jonas married in 2018, both bride and groom wore traditional and hybrid Indian and Western clothes in a multi-continent series of ceremonies, showers, and celebrations. For their Hindu wedding, Jonas rocked a gold silk shawani, an embroidered dupatta, a feathered turban, and Christian Louboutin loafers. Sometimes it's the bridal party that provides cultural flavor, as in these royal weddings, featuring attendants wearing picturesque but antiquated national or folk dress. The tradition of dressing bridesmaids alike and in white derives from their ancient function as decoy brides, intended to fool evil spirits or thwart kidnappers. No one appreciated their role in creating an unforgettable tableau better than Cecil Beaton, the acclaimed British photographer and designer for film and theater. For his sister Nancy's wedding in 1933, he added wedding planner to his resume and dressed the bridesmaid in white gowns with swags of white flowers across the bodice. And then he had them carry two garlands of white flowers instead of bouquets. So it looked as if they were roped together by flowers. The tradition of wearing white began to wane in the 1880s, however, when English author and illustrator Kate Greenaway published a series of popular children's stories depicting young women and girls in pastoral settings wearing colorful floral dresses inspired by 18th century fashions. Brides took note, dressing their attendants in floral prints with straw hats or be-ribbon bonnets. The need for decoy brides had long since passed, and the thought of anyone mistaking someone else for the bride was horrifying, not reassuring. Indeed, it soon became considered a breach of etiquette to wear white to a wedding. At this 1892 wedding in Detroit, the bridesmaids wore identical dresses in different floral patterns, except for the maid of honor who wore ivory, so there was at least one decoy on hand. The idea of decoy brides was still indirectly influencing bridesmaid fashion in 1967, when first daughter Lucy Johnson got married in Washington, D.C. Her bridesmaids wore short sleeve versions of the bride's own long sleeve lace gown in cotton candy pink silk moire, complete with long veils. But the maid of honor, Lucy's older single sister, Linda Bird, wasn't happy with her dress. According to the designer, Priscilla Kidder, better known as Priscilla of Boston, Linda thought she blended in too much with the other bridesmaids and kept complaining that she needed something to make her stand out. Clearly, she didn't get the memo about her role as a symbolic decoy. Finally, in frustration, Priscilla grabbed her scissors and chopped off the floor-length veil to elbow length. There, she said, now you stand out. Linda was horrified, and a replacement veil was quickly found. When Linda herself got married the following year, she did not ask Priscilla of Boston to make her wedding gown. While White's bridesmaids' dresses never really went away in the UK, Pippa Middleton's show-stopping turn in a form-fitting Alexander McQueen gown at her sister's 2011 wedding revived the fashion in the United States, 
where Kim Kardashian model Chanel Iman and Kim Kardashian again, and many other brides subsequently dressed their bridesmaids in all white. Just as modern brides are guided by their own preferences and personalities, rather than tradition when selecting a dress, bridesmaids are no longer expected to be cookie cutter copies of the bride or each other. Mismatched bride bridesmaid gowns, once again popularized by celebrities, movies, and television shows like Sex and the City, allow each bridesmaid to choose a style that suits her own taste and figure. It's no accident that this trend was embraced by mid-priced fashion chains like J. Crew and Anthropology in their own wedding collections. While the gowns aren't exactly cheap, it makes more sense for a budget-conscious bride to invest in something she chose herself and might even wear again, especially if it's black, another one-time fashion taboo at weddings that has now fallen by the wayside. It's not just the bridal party that puts a lot of thought and effort into their clothes. Garments that the guests wore to significant weddings over the years have been preserved by their wearers, memorialized by, their, by artists, auctioned on eBay, and collected by museums as souvenirs of history-making marriages and legendary parties. But while fashion magazines and etiquette books are full of sartorial advice for brides and grooms, Guests receive far less guidance and often have to cope with confusingly creative dress codes like dressy casual, beach formal, or the ever-popular black tie optional. Matthias Schwartz, a 16th century Augsburg accountant, undertook the unusual project of documenting his wardrobe in a series of hand-drawn portraits he commissioned between 1520 and 1560 at a time when people effectively designed their own clothes with the help of tailors, dressmakers, and shoemakers, Schwartz took pride in his stylish color and fabric choices as he planned spectacular new outfits for a variety of occasions, including several weddings, important social networking events that justified the purchase of impressive new outfits. In 1524, he attended a wedding wearing the outfit in the center, accessorized with a heart-shaped red purse worn hanging from his belt. Red and green were the colors of hope and desire. Together with the heart-shaped purse, they referenced the happy occasion while also advertising Schwartz's own ongoing search for a wife. Fashion-conscious mothers of the bride or groom walked a fine line between looking elegant and looking ridiculous. At the wedding of her eldest daughter in 1858, Queen Victoria made sure all eyes were on her by choosing a gown in the trendiest shade of the time, mauve, a new chemical dye that created a vivid pinkish purplish hue not found in nature. She accessorized with the Kohinoor, the largest known diamond in the world at the time. Another scene-stealing mother of the bride, the famously fashionable Countess Griffiel, attended her daughter Elaine's 1904 wedding in Paris in the fur-trimmed silver brocade Worth Couture gown at the left. When she entered the church, the guests reportedly gasped, my God, is that the mother of the bride? At heiress Cornelia Vanderbilt's 1924 wedding at the right, her widowed mother Edith gave her away. The local newspaper reported that the six foot tall 51 year old looked perfectly thrilling in an oriental turban of gold tissue, enormously long pear shaped earrings, solidly set with diamonds and a white ostrich boa. As dedicated bridal magazines and bridal shops began to pop up in the 1930s, more subdued fashions specifically designed for mothers of the bride and groom came on the market usually in muted shades of pastel or gray. A summons to a royal wedding has always brought a special kind of panic over what to wear and how to pay for it. Everyone remembers Princess Diana's 1981 wedding gown, but what did the guests wear? Los Angeles socialite Betsy Bloomingdale and her husband at left received one of the coveted invitations to the ceremony at St. Paul's Cathedral. 
they traveled to London in style with Betsy's friend, First Lady Nancy Reagan, on Air Force One. A reporter on board noted that the festive atmosphere was not unlike college girls going to a debutante party, but failed to uncover what Betsy and Nancy would wear to the big event. Like Lady Di, who kept her wedding gown a closely guarded secret until she stepped out of her horse-drawn carriage, neither woman would reveal what she was going to wear, including to each other, apparently. They ended up wearing very similar ensembles, though both were custom-made and they had not planned to match. Betsy, a peach-colored silk crepe dress with an olive cummerbund and a matching cape and wide-brimmed hat by Mark Bowen for Christian Dior, and Reagan, a peach suit with a long coat and a wide-brimmed hat designed by Los Angeles designer James Galanos. Fortunately, Reagan was seated away from Bloomingdale with the other visiting heads of state, so no one noticed the fashion emergency. And both ladies undoubtedly felt vindicated when Diana departed for her honeymoon, also wearing a peach dress, jacket, and hat. While her iconic wedding dress would never be worn again, Diana wore this Belleville Sassoon going away ensemble on several occasions and even had a second long sleeve jacket made so she could get more use out of it. The final chapter of my book covers this and other going away ensembles. Today, we might call it the exit dress or getaway dress, but the going away dress has been an essential part of wedding wardrobes since honeymoons and white gowns became widely popular in the late 19th century. Arguably even more important than the wedding gown itself, since it was more likely to be worn again. Fashion magazines paid close attention to going away outfits. A wedding gown might represent a reader's fantasy, but the going away dress was a more relatable and achievable fashion statement, one that even non-brides could emulate. Accordingly, these bridal issues of Mademoiselle from the 1940s put going away suits on the cover rather than white gowns. Many brides chose to set out on their honeymoons in ensembles suitable for the rigors of tra travel. And over the years, these styles changed along with transportation technology. Once it might have meant a tailored suit in subdued colors and sturdy fabrics. Today, it might mean an outfit referencing a tropical honeymoon destination. Sometimes the wedding gown and the going away dress were one and the same. Louise Whitfeld wore this versatile traveling suit when she married industrialist Andrew Carnegie aboard a ship en route to their European honeymoon in 1887. It could be transformed into many different looks by mixing and matching different cuffs, collars, and bodice fronts. The ingenious ensemble must have been worn several times during the voyage. A much less practical going away ensemble survives in the Glasgow Museum's collection. Elizabeth Holmes Kerr was married in her grandmother's 60-year-old wedding dress in 1899. Wedding gowns were the original vintage fashion. But she changed into an up-to-the-minute going-away outfit in luminous royal blue wool appliqued with velvet and braid in a swirling Art Nouveau pattern. For a bride who wore a traditional or heirloom wedding gown, the going-away dress was an opportunity to show off her personality and fashion sense. Going away dresses remained an expected part of a bride's trousseau until the late 1960s, and the tradition is still observed today, especially for royal weddings. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge spent the night at Buckingham Palace after their wedding reception and didn't leave on their honeymoon for more than a week. Nevertheless, an image of the couple in their business casual going away clothes departing the palace by helicopter the following morning was duly distributed to the media, William looking a bit worse for wear. I handed in the manuscript of my book just before COVID hit, so there are no pandemic weddings in it. But if I had included some, I would have put them in the wartime weddings chapter. Just like war brides, COVID era couples have responded bravely and creatively to a time of danger, scarcity, and uncertainty planning ceremonies that are no less romantic for being small, simple, or last minute. One of my favorites was the wedding of singer Lily Allen and actor David Harbour. Their Vegas wedding chapel ceremony was virtually indistinguishable from pre-pandemic Vegas elopements. 
The bride's retro Dior dress paid tribute to the Rat Pack era. And even though it's white, she'll definitely be able to wear it again, something today's brides increasingly value for reasons of sustainability, if not wartime austerity. Similarly, we saw both Princess Beatrice and Eunice Kennedy Shriver recycle and remodel vintage couture gowns that had belonged to their famous grandmothers, lending poignancy and perspective, as well as sustainability, to their drastically scaled back ceremonies. Other brides had informal weddings at home or outdoors, but wore the formal white gown of their dreams, even if they had to do their own hair and makeup. Some couples reconceived their ceremonies as drive-ins or tailgate parties as at top. Others donated the food from their canceled receptions to charity and served it in their wedding clothes with masks and hairnets at bottom left. The bride at bottom right canceled her 100-person dream wedding and got married on the lawn at City Hall, celebrating with immediate family and a cake from Costco. But she repurposed her unused reception gown a few months later for another important milestone, getting her COVID vaccine. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Kimberly, I... You know, those are such beautiful photos. And thank you for sharing these gorgeous images and the memorable, touching and funny stories that go along with these, with, with the wedding fashion. Um, a reminder that a link to Kimberly's book, The Way We Wed, A Global History of Wedding is available for purchase in um uh, on the link in the chat box. And we've got so many great questions from the audience. Um, we may not get to all of them. We might even go over a little bit. So, so, let's, let's, uh, so let's start now. How did you pick um, some of these photos to include in your book? I know that you have um, well over 100 photos, um, but it must be very difficult to uh, select the ones that you want to keep for the book. How did you, how was that process like? It, it, it was so difficult <laughs> to narrow it down. It, I could have had 200 or 300 easily. Um, it, it, I was able to get most everything I wanted for the book. Uh, there, there were a few, though, unfortunately, that I would like to include and couldn't uh, because they were sold to People Magazine or Hello Magazine. Um, this is a, a more recent trend in, in celebrity weddings. Uh, if you let one one publication have your wedding pictures, then they can kind of control them, and and uh, you have a little a little more agency over where your pictures end up and how they're used, uh, which is great um, at the time. But you know, when it's ten or fifteen years later, and somebody wants to put them in a book, it's it's still hard to get them. So I, I got almost everything I wanted in the end, um, apart from a couple of celebrity pictures that I showed you tonight. <laughs> These are so great. We're we're very lucky to have the ones that uh, that we have for the book. Um, while researching for this book, what was the most, uh, what's the most surprising thing for you uh, when you're looking at all the photos and, um, and reading about all of these weddings across uh, time and culture? Well, I kept coming back to this issue of um, things that we think we invented and that we think are very new and trendy uh, are actually not at all. Um, it, it's it's all, all been done before. Whereas a lot of things that we consider very traditional, like the veil, for example, um, you know, in historical terms are, are fairly new. Uh, I, I also surprised myself because uh, I'm a vegetarian. I don't wear fur, but I love a fur wedding gown. <laughs> and there are so many fur trim gowns in this book uh, that I just fell in love with. And I'm not sure what that says about me, but uh, I can't resist a gown with fur on it. There's, a, there's this great question from the audience that's asking, what are your thoughts on um, Bright's wearing several white dresses for, uh, for her wedding and her party? I, again, it's nothing new. Um, it's, it's something that is a long part of wedding tradition. I mean, clothes in general have been part of wedding traditions going back to ancient times. Um, they, they were portable wealth in many cases. Uh, so it wasn't just a symbolic form of wealth. It was actually something you did to wear your wealth. And, and that included many different kinds of outfits over a whole long uh, process of engagement parties, of engagement ceremonies, betrothal ceremonies, uh, pre and post wedding events. Um, yeah, go for it. You know, this is um, a follow up question to the response you just gave, which is uh, what is the most 
um, ancient wedding tradition that you have become aware of? Well, I, I had to start this book in the Renaissance because I, I just couldn't cover, you know, the entire history of weddings. It goes too far back. Um, but let's see the um, the idea of of having a an engagement ceremony and having a, a special dress for that that was actually more important than the wedding dress itself um, is one that goes way back uh, again because it would be it would be worn again and because it was often the the first time that the bride saw her husband. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We've got this also another really great question. What has been, uh, in your view, the impact of feminism and the wedding dress uh, on the wedding dress? Um, This person noticed recently that there was a short trend of women choosing to wear pantsuits like their husbands. Um, And, you know, these noticeably, noticeably, these pantsuit these pantsuits are very feminized by the bride, um, but uh, we wanted to get your view on the impact of feminism on wedding fashion. Yes, well, it, it was a big deal when women started wearing mini skirts for their weddings um, in the 60s. And then in the 70s, you did see a lot of pantsuits. Everybody go Google Orna Luff's wedding. She has an amazing kind of lace pantsuit on. Uh, and, and this still happens today. Uh, I, I don't think that ever really went away, although it, it hasn't replaced wedding dresses. Um, and and I, I think one of the reasons why the idea of a wedding dress being outdated or being traditional or being very, you know, Victorian looking has survived is because many ceremonial clothes derive their their sort of emotional and philosophical weight from their visible links to the past. I mean, this is why graduates wear mortar boards and robes that you know students used to wear in medieval times. Um, by keeping these things alive and by by wearing things that are visibly not just out of fashion, but but hundreds of years out of date, it um, creates continuity and it and it it establishes a link with the past and with this uh, tradition of marriage that has gone back so far. You know, you um, showed us some slides of uh, of these beautiful wedding dresses um, and these very touching stories of brides that either we reworked them or we rewore them. Mm. Um, the question is, uh, the question from the audience is, um, did you find the same uh, with non-Western brides, for example, Hanbox or uh, Lengas? Well, because um, the book would have been 600 pages if I'd, if I'd <laughs> done everything I wanted to do, I, I really looked at, at Western weddings that incorporated uh, different cultural traditions more than what was going on in other countries. But certainly what's happening in Japan is really interesting in terms of wearing multiple wedding dresses and having a Western style wedding, a kimono and a hybrid. There's been some really amazing, beautiful uh, hybrid gowns uh, worn in Japanese uh, weddings over the past you know, 10 or 20 years that are worth looking at. Um, here's another great question from the audience, um, uh, an audience member. What are your thoughts on young people of other cultures um, having dual wedding, um, one that's uh, traditional to their culture and one that is Western or, or what, you know, or American? Um, the, you know, what do you think is the driver of these types of dual weddings? Well, again, I think this is nothing new. I mean, there, there's... Uh a beautiful uh, Korean uh, wedding dress in my book that was worn by a Japanese princess. And they had a, a, they got married in Japan. And then two years later, they had their wedding in Korea too. So they, they did both. And, and um, why, why not? Why not do that now? Yeah, um, exactly. Why not? I, we've got um, many people who ask this question and I think uh, it's something that I'm also very curious about also, which is, um, what do you think uh, is going to be the post-pandemic wedding fashion style? Um, what do you think uh, is, how has this period impacted the way we are going to um, embrace wedding fashion going forward? Well, you know, a lot of people have asked me this question about fashion in general, about what happens going forward. And I, and I think it goes in two different directions. I think it goes way over the top in, in some cases. And I, and I think maybe it's a little more 
chill, uh, chilled out in some ways. Like maybe we'll be seeing more Zoom weddings. If not everybody can actually go to the destination wedding, they'll have the option to watch it on Zoom perhaps. But at the same time, I think a lot of brides who have postponed their weddings or who have been waiting a long time to get married um, have been saving their pennies and might might go way over the top in terms of what they're wearing and how they're celebrating. Well, Kimberly, we're all wondering this, which is personally for you, what can you tell us about one of your favorite wedding dresses? Uh, my favorite one in, in the book uh, was worn by um, Empress Soraya of Iran. Um, mm. And it was a Dior couture gown. It had fur on it. Uh, it had a strap. It was a strapless dress with a matching jacket. Uh, so she wore the jacket for the ceremony and then took off the dress. And, and uh, it, it was so cold. She got buried in February that she actually had to wear wool socks under the dress. So there's, there's some great stories that go along with it. You know, the wedding was postponed because she, she'd been really sick and she still wasn't feeling great. And halfway through the reception, they had to cut off the train of this Dior gown uh, to help her stand up basically because it was so heavy. So it, it's really just got it all. Um, and that, that's one of my favorites, but, but as I said, all of the fur gowns really are my favorite. That's amazing. Um, we've got a couple more that came in that are very interesting. So I wanted to ask this of you, Kimberly. Um, what do you think um, about the impact of reality TV shows like Say Yes to the Dress? Yeah, that, that's a really great, great question. Um, and I, and I, I think it goes along with the celebrity weddings, just in terms of kind of raising the bar and, and giving people inspiration for their own weddings. Um, you know, we, we, we all have heard of the Bridezilla and we can maybe argue that shows like that contribute to that stereotype or to that kind of behavior. Um, but I, I think good things come out of them too. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they're great advertising for weddings and for, uh, you know, the wedding industry in general, obviously. We love asking you about trends. So here's another one that we wanted to hear views on. Um, do you think that same sex marriages will become more lavish as it becomes more acceptable? I, I think we're already there, honestly. Um, I, I included some great same sex weddings in the book. Um, and they, they, uh, set trends for both same-sex weddings and heterosexual weddings. Let's face it, you, you can you can wear these things no matter who you're marrying. And uh, I, I think there's been some really interesting, though, as I said, some some work done by by the clothes that same-sex um, couples have chosen. Uh, often they wear matching outfits, uh, which I, I, I think is a, a great way to, particularly for men, you know, they might wear the same suit in different colors or the same suit with a different tie. So you have the individuality, but you also have this sense of we're a team and, you know, we're in this together and uh, really highlighting the fact that they, they are kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a pair of men or a pair of women uh, rather than differentiating on gender lines. But of course it goes the other way too, where you might have uh, things that are linked by color or linked by fabric, but are very different um, uh, dresses or different suits. You uh, showed us this slide, which was so uh, was so shocking, which is that one mil that million dollar wedding. This question is something I, th I think we're all wondering about, which is what was the most expensive wedding dress that you've researched? Oh, you know, <laughs> I, I wasn't really looking at prices so much. That's that's a great question. I I, I think certainly that one. Um, it wasn't just the dress, of course. The entire wedding was pretty amazing and they you know they left the wedding on a yacht um that was that was named after the bride <laughs> so, and there was a band playing on on the yacht and there there's there's a lot of great detail from that wedding uh that that makes you appreciate why why it cost a million dollars um but but it seemed like every 10 years there was a new million dollar wedding or a wedding of the century um things just kept getting bigger and better so no matter how much uh, the wedding cost, there would be another one. I mean, I, I really thought in my book, uh, I talked about Laura Santa Domingo's wedding in, in Cartagena and what a kind of over the top lavish celebration that was going to be. Uh, and, and and how it, there was almost a backlash because it was it was so over the top that people kind of thought, you know, this is immoral, <laughs> you're spending this much money. Uh, and, and so I'd, I'd originally written it as you know, this is, it can't get any bigger than this. This is the end. Now there's a backlash. And, and then uh, Nick and Priyanka came along and I had to rewrite that because that wedding um, did all that on several continents. 
Amazing. I, I, I can't, I can't tell you how wonderful these images are. Um, I want to know uh, just, you know, selfishly, what are you working on next? Because we are, we just want to have you back again so quickly. So what, what's on the horizon for you? Oh, well, thank you very much. I, I've got a couple things in progress. Uh, one, one is a book on the 1968 White House fashion show, um, which is the only fashion show that's ever been held at the White House for, for reasons that will be explained in the book. Uh, and uh, the other is a book uh, tentatively titled Skirts, which is about fashion and femininity in the 20th century. Um, and then as part of my NEH fellowship, I'm, I'm actively working on a biography of uh, designer Chester Weinberg. So lots of different projects in different stages. And um, I'm not even sure which one's going to come out first, probably the White <laughs> House fashion show. Well, we'll be following uh, the progress of these both these books very closely. Um, we are at the end of our program, and I just want to say thank you for joining us today. Kimberly, what an honor to have you with us. I just want to remind our audience that if you're interested in Kimberly's book, The Way We Wet, the link to purchase a book is in the chat box. If you're interested in other programs presented by the National Arts Club, you are uh, you can visit our YouTube channel. You can also go to nationalartsclub.org to find more information. I am Angela Louie. This is Dr. Kimberly Christman Campbell. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.